Urvita, thank you for joining in. Of course, Arish, <laughs> my absolute pleasure. <laughs> All right. So I was I I was wondering how do I start and where do I start. So I thought the best course of action would be to ask you to introduce yourself, and then sure. you give me some talk points on what to discuss uh, further. So why don't you? How do you introduce yourself now usually? Sure. So I'm Urvita. I am from Goa. Um, I've been working in the field of global mental health since the past eight years. My background is in psychology and in global mental health. And my main areas of interest are um, understanding how do you develop interventions for addictions and gender-based violence through mm-hmm. research. Okay. All right. Okay. So a lot of talking points for me to latch on to now. <laughs> so <laughs> sh- switching from psychology to global mental health. Right? Hmm. When hmm. and how did that happen? Right, that's um, taking me back to eight years back, actually. So uh-huh. it was not planned at all. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was pursuing psychology, I did not imagine that I would have ever uh, reached the stage where I'm practicing and pursuing studies and research as well in this field of global mental health. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was unplanned. I had finished my graduation in psychology in Goa at St. Xavier's College. And after that, I had applied for a master's degree in Christ University. Mm. So I, I studied there for two years. I did my master's in clinical psychology. And after that master's, I was looking out for a job. And it took me quite some jo- time to reach the perfect uh, mm. organization and job, which is where I am right now, Sangat. Um, and in that one year, what I had done was I, you, I tried to gain a lot of experience in turning with psychologists in Goa and in schools as well. And finally landed the perfect job in Sangat. Um, and then when I entered the world of uh, research in Sangat, yeah. I remember it was 4th of October 2012. Wow. I entered, that, I entered the world and ever since there's been no looking back from uh-huh. that day. Mm-hmm. And um, within one month of, that, um, of, of working in Sangat, I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So okay. although I'd entered with a different intention, I wanted to pursue my uh, further uh, education in clinical psychology and go on to practice mm. as a clinical psychologist. My, I shifted focus to, uh, my, my focus to global mental health mm. and landed mm. up there. Yeah, so it was that completely was... unplanned. And yeah. um, it is all because of entering Sangat eight years back. Yeah, that, that was, I think, for that uh, SHARE project, wasn't it? Yes. So I started my career in Sangat working in the SHARE project and the SHARE project was essentially trying to understand how do you develop a treatment for maternal depression for mm. uh, mothers in Goa. Yeah. yeah. And and then, uh, so so you mentioned you, you came in first with an intention of pursuing clinical psychology and mm. practicing, right? Mm. So uh, how did that switch happen after that? Because I... Uh, if you had come in with some goal, I mean, what was so enticing about this aspect of this this career that got you hooked? I think two for two reasons. I was uh, completely fascinated by the field of global mental health. And I feel that I really understood what it meant on the ground before going on to completing the degree, which I did three years later after entering Sangat. Um, mm-hmm. So for two reasons, I feel I, I made that switch. One was that um, in, when I entered uh, Sangat in 2012, there were uh, many people around who were doing fantastic work and mm-hmm. were visionaries in their own sense and um, were able to um, look at problems and, and then look at solutions and work those solutions out so that mm-hmm. we can completely change how mental health care is conceptualized and uh, delivered. So that was very fascinating to me. And the second reason why was because of the potential impact. Um, So if I had pursued a degree in clinical psychology, I would have most likely um, engaged in um, clinical practice somewhere in Goa or somewhere else perhaps, and done therapy, uh, which which may have been delivered one-to-one. But through the work in Sangat, I understood how you can really make impact at scale. And that idea really uh, appealed to me and that's the second reason why I stuck on and I still have, um, it still appeals to me and I've still considered that to be my main pursuit. 
Okay. Uh, you have touched upon a very valid uh, uh, point here because uh, a lot of uh, what happens is usually when you think about careers in psychology, you often think of what you just described, one-to-one -one sessions in a clinic setting, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. now, could you put this whole concept of global mental health in layman terms as as simple as you can, and then related to the kinds of work that you are you are involved in right now, and, and you talked about making an impact on a larger scale. So, can you tell us a bit more about what this concept entails? Because uh, as when you're studying psychology, we don't hear this term a lot in the classroom, which is a pity. But uh, can you uh, tell us a bit more about this? Yes, exactly. Just to reflect on the last point that you made, it is a pity that we are not taught about this in class. Um, mm -hmm. And as I've been sharing with you over many, many years, uh, one of my goals in the future is to ensure that uh, we change the, the way we look at psychology curriculum. But I guess that's a conversation for a later day. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so if I could briefly summarize what is global mental health. Um, so global mental health is quite a young field. Um, it officially came into existence in around 2007. So in the later years of the 2000s. And um, it was, of course, there for quite some time before that as well. Uh, global mental health basically places priority on improving uh, health of people across the lifespan and the health of people across uh, populations around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an area for study, it's an area for research, it's an area for practice, it's an area for policy as well. And the main distinction that I understood in my early years of working with Sangha, Sangat was that global mental health uh, allows you to achieve impact at population levels. So instead of considering care, which you can deliver, so for example, CBT, which is delivered one-to-one -one or by a therapist to a group, you can actually conceptualize care models that are delivered at the population level and hence make impact at scale. Mm -hmm. So that was an idea which I was saying was uh, had appealed to me back then. And that is one of the core principles of global mental health as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this all happened when you joined Sangat in 2012. Uh, 12. 12, 12. Okay. And then um, you uh, you went off for your uh, master's in public health course uh, yes. in in London. So how was that? I'm sure you enjoyed every aspect of it, every bit of it. Yes, absolutely. So it actually helped me put into practice what I began to feel after completing my master's in clinical psychology. So when I had completed that degree, I had said to myself that I will take some time and work and then only go on to pursue my next degree. And um, that's exactly what I went on to do. I worked with Sangat uh, in Sangat for two years, realized mm -hmm. that I have a lot of areas where I could improve myself on. And uh, because the Global Mental Health Masters that was available at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and King's College London, was directly um, suited for the work that we were doing in Sangat. I only applied for that course. So the okay. intention was just to uh, solidify what I had learned on the ground and to ensure that I build up capacities that would then take me um, further in my career in the field. Yeah. All right. So I, I, um, I worked for around two years and I worked in, in, in two different roles before going on to doing that master's. So when I joined yeah. Sangat, I worked as a junior researcher and I uh, mainly focus my efforts on collecting data on the ground, analyzing that data. And then mm -hmm. in the second part of my uh, two years in Sangat, before my master's, I then went on to become an intervention facilitator, where I became mm -hmm. more involved in understanding the treatment that we were de delivering and how to best improve that and then training people in that treatment. Okay. So when you when you were working as a researcher, right, in the mm -hmm. early part of your career at Sangat, what were some of the challenges that you encountered on the job? Right. So I think one of the biggest challenge is what we understand of research when we complete our masters and what is actually research on the ground. Um, I think that um, it's not only my masters, but a lot of taught programs in India and in psychology expose you to a very theoretical understanding of research. Mm -hmm. And you don't really gain skills um, in the area of applied research. So that was one of the difficulties. I had to put in extra effort to ensure that I understood the concepts well and also practiced it so that I can get feedback from my supervisors over time. Uh, mm -hmm. That was one major difficulty. 
um and um i think i didn't face many more because we had an excellent team of of uh, people who knew what they were doing so mm-hmm. the, my mentor who was there back then provided a lot of input into the research process both in terms of collection and analysis of data um i had the supervisor who was a research supervisor i had the supervisor who was a clinical supervisor so they were very um, reliable and uh, supportive and helpful Okay. so um i didn't face too many challenges because there was a system in place to address um mm. any needs that we had especially training needs but the mm. most difficult bit when i just joined in was just that shock that of okay fine when we finish our degrees we think that we know research but on the ground when we actually have to use that we practically mm-hmm. have uh, less i mean we have practically no exposure at all to what is relevant on the ground so that's mm. the major difficulty yeah did you have any interviews to do in konkani when you started out and you know i'm asking you this yes i know i'm asking you this and for everyone else uh, arish is asking me this because i although <laughs> i uh, can listen to konkani and understand it i can't speak it and if i were to speak it it would turn into a circus so uh, <laughs> hence back then i didn't i i didn't uh, do any of the interviews in konkani it would have yeah. been absolutely hilarious uh, even <laughs> basic interactions in konkani in office turned out to be so hilarious and fun for everyone yeah. so that was good but yeah. on the ground I, i i didn't dare speak in konkani while interviewing <laughs> i do i i did uh, do that while um, networking or talking to people try that out yeah. but not when there were formal interactions so you've most of the data now. collection you've, was in english you you have gotten yes. better at konkani now from when i when i last heard you so so good well done on that thank you can some time but you are there almost there thank you arish thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay then from from uh, Uh, your um, from the so post coming of back research. to the point actually because you yeah. interestingly brought up language and and okay. uh, language could be um, conceived as a challenge that I faced back then as well, uh, yes. which is I although I did understand Konkani I didn't speak it and mm-hmm. and that did allow me to engage with people who spoke your who spoke only Konkani or Marathi. so um it was a challenge back then as well language uh, i think if you are working in a community you should uh, try as much as possible to connect with people using the same language that they use yeah, uh, have yeah. said that i think that what sangat allows you to do is is build on your strengths and then work based on each other's strengths so i think the fact that there was such a wonderful team around and they were mm. so understanding uh, we basically did did activities and things that um, matched our interests and also strengths so that helped a lot yeah and 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 uh, i'm reminded now that curiously now you brought it up um anisha and revati who were there mm. along with you in the share project also did not speak konkani to the best of my knowledge and yet they could work fantastically well in the in the project right which just tells you the kind of support system that was put in place uh, for the research to go on so that was a very good thing that that they had that Absolutely. everyone has in their favor there okay. Absolutely. yeah yeah all right so then moving on to uh, intervention facilitator what what happened there and how what how was that different from that of a researcher Sure. So um, when I moved on to intervention facilitator, I had two main roles. One is that I needed to understand the treatment in in much more detail um, from a perspective of um, uh, clinical practice. So it was a CBT based treatment, and mm-hmm. I also had to train people in uh, using that treatment on the ground. Now, one of the most beautiful aspects about our work in sangat is that uh, and beautiful as well as important uh, kind of cornerstones of our work is that we used uh, we use something called the task sharing model mm. so we basically train people who have little or no experience at all in mental health in providing basic psychosocial care on the ground and uh, through years and years and years of research we have found that that's a model that's effective and that's a model that has also found to be effective in many other parts of the world so mm. my 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 second role i mean the second job that i was talking about was more focused on training these lay health workers in delivering uh, the cbt based treatment in the community to mothers and then supervise them over time 
So uh, those are the two main areas of work. One was understand the treatment in a lot more detail and work with it so that we improve it. And the second was to train and supervise lay health workers uh, to deliver it on the ground. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to spend some more time on this because when I heard about task sharing, it, it came as a shock to me because on one side, we talk about uh, the complexities of delivering a psychological uh, uh, therapy in person. But on the, on the, on the other hand, uh, in task sharing, what you're essentially doing is you're teaching uh, people who are not trained in psychology beforehand to yet become effective uh, administrators of the treatment, right? And, and was it easy? Was it difficult? How was this? I'm going to training right, people. So. Right. right. So I guess uh, initially, I guess it it's something that might not sound too easy, especially for someone who comes in from this, this these disciplines such as psychology, psychiatry, social work. Uh, but I think it was easy for me to make that transition to both understand that, apply that, um, and also believe in that. Because it very much matches my personality and very much matches my uh, philosophy and kind of outlook towards life. Um, if this is something that works and is something that can potentially be a game changer, why not? Mm. And um, that's why early on I, I read up more about it. I tried to understand it through colleagues at Sangat as well. Uh, I tried to work with it myself through the role of an intervention facilitator. And to be honest, Arish, I learned so much through that process that I that I fully, fully um, believe in it. And I feel that it makes the whole mental health community stronger to have yeah. people who are trained well um, and supervised well. I think one important, uh, I mean, people like these who have no background in, in psychology to train them well and supervise them well. I think an extremely important aspect around uh, community mental health work, especially the work that we're doing in Sangat, is the aspect of uh, training, which is rigorous and um, of very good quality, but also supervision. And I mm. think the latter is completely missing from um, the general space yeah. of private clinical psychology, counseling psychology, etc. And that is, I think, extremely essential if you really want to make change in um, on the ground in terms of what people receive, the quality of the care, and uh, how much of that they receive, etc. So um, training and supervision, I think, is, is extremely important, which is what we play, uh, which which is what we emphasize on a lot in our work. Hmm. Okay. All right. So let's let's shift gears now. Let's go back to the timeline that. We were mm. talking about earlier, right? So, uh, intervention facilitator, and then when did did the did the uh, masters in public health happen soon after that? Yes, yes. So I left okay. for my masters in global mental health in 2014 uh, in September, and it was a one year masters. Most masters mm. in the UK are for for a year, so it was a one year masters uh, with a nine month taught component and then three month of uh, dissertation. Okay, uh, one year course, and then I remember when you came back, you were completely changed. I, <laughs> I was okay. It. Yeah, you you I were just you were. Tell me more. <laughs> yes, I was <laughs> no. completely changed. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, I mean, not that you weren't, but you had become much more confident in the way you presented yourself, and and you you talked about or you held your own ground in interaction. Not that. It was uh, uh, lacking earlier, but uh, I could see a, 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 a significant change, so to speak. Thank so, you, Arish. <laughs> yeah, that, that, what was that experience like studying there, being there by yourself? Absolutely the best decision of my life. Uh, I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> right now, you know, thinking about that. So um, I, I often tell... I can use the word young people now because I'm quite old. <laughs> so I, I often... No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I often tell younger people that uh, okay, yeah. uh, if you have the opportunity, uh, please try and, and study um, in institutes like these. Um, try to um, get exposure to an international classroom because that really makes a huge difference. So I absolutely enjoyed my one year in London uh, for many reasons. Uh, and I think it was the best decision that I had made. 
and i think it really allowed me to test my own hypothesis that if you wait if yeah. you if you study and then take a break and work and then study again that's going to lead to better learning outcomes it absolutely helped me prove my own hypothesis for myself yeah. So I, I think what really made me enjoy the course was that I had that two-year foundational experience in Sangat. I was able to make sense of what was being taught in class and then offer more in the classroom because I was able to make sense of that. And at the same time, learn skills which would then help me advance my research career in the field. So it was useful from that perspective. I, I had, um, I was day in and day out um, interacting with people from different parts of the world which really helped me grow as well um, it was a beautiful city to be in as well um, there is not a single day that goes by in that place it's very much like Bombay I feel or many of the other metros in India uh, where um, there's not a day that goes by but there's nothing to do there's so much to do um, in that city both academically as well as uh, in terms of leisure so there were so many opportunities within the university to build my own capacities, but also beyond, like outside the university, there were free events that you could go to, free seminars, um, there were lectures wow. that were going on in colleges close by to this university as well, which you could go mm -hmm. to. Um, and basically, I just had that year to myself, um, trying to understand what I really want from this field. I became so comfortable with it. I was I was absolutely enjoying that classroom experience. I enjoyed being in London. I um, and I think that helped me grow. I think overall, I complete. I felt that was completely the best decision I have made. And then um, I I also I'm not sure whether you know this, but I also stayed on. So I had finished my masters oh. in September of 2015, but I stayed okay. for three more months, not because I wanted to work there in the long term. But because I just wanted to get exposed to a work environment over there before coming back here to see if I could learn anything more and pick up more things before coming back. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, I, I worked uh, in two different organizations, both in the area of global mental health. And I picked up many more skills which were relevant to my uh, job when I came back. For someone who's looking out to start a career in research in India, what do you think would be the best course of action for him or her? Right. So I do agree with you um, that uh, it's pretty difficult to navigate the system in India. And again, that's for various reasons. I'd just like to reflect on one more bit before I tell you a bit more about navigating research opportunities in India. Um, one of the other things which an international degree like that helps is another uh, one of the other ways in which it helps is that you then become a part of a community which mm -hmm. is um, which has similar interests as you. Yeah. and similar intentions as you and that is very empowering to 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 know that you're not alone uh, in trying to achieve this impact that you want at scale in trying to mm. ensure that um, people who require mental health care dis get the care that they require that they require um, so you, you're really a part of a community which i really enjoyed at that point of time and which i feel that organizations like sangat allow you to have as well uh, which I enjoy, what, which is again what I enjoy about Sangat too. So coming to the point of research opportunities in India and how should a person navigate the system in India, I do agree it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that if someone is considering a career in research, um, to try, if possible, try getting in touch with organizations that work in the field of public health mm -hmm. or any other organization of interest which match your research interests and uh, start interacting with them, start getting a sense of what they're doing, research what they're doing, I mean, read up about these organizations and people, see if you can find mentors in the field, see if you can find people of your age, see if you can find people who have the time to speak to you as well. Um, get in touch with them, connect with them, try to understand what they're doing, see if your interests match theirs as well, and then try to offer something that is of interest to them, to the organization as well as of to you. And mm. I think making that slow entry into um, into research is is one way of navigating the system over here. And the second way is also, of course, to pursue formal education. So we do have degrees that are offered by public health universities in India, uh, as well as um, mental health institutes such as NIMHANS in uh, clinical psychology and counseling psychology, which although has a uh, strong focus on clinical practice, also has a focus on research. 
so one mm. can consider formal training opportunities like that but i really mm. like the idea of the former where you you get in touch with organizations which are already working in the area and try to offer something and see if there are any opportunities that you can pursue with them yeah because and that works in uh, from a different perspective as well because once you start working in an organization like that you will know for yourself whether you are suited for a career in research whether it's something you want to do otherwise on the other hand you might you know, go in with uh, an interest in research and pursue a course but then realize after that that hang on no i am much more suited towards clinical work so um, joining an organization and testing the waters first is something i think that that makes some much more sense for someone who's starting a research Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and also to uh, bear in mind that that process takes a lot of time. Yeah. So um, I think that one should be patient through the process and keep trying, because that's exactly what happened in my journey and also the journey of many other people who I work with as well. Um, mm-hmm. When I wanted to enter Sangat, I had literally put in a lot of effort around twelve to eighteen months before I had entered Sangat uh, to ensure that I. Uh, reach the get the right opportunity over there and apply for that as well so it takes mm-hmm. quite some time and i think what you could do in the meanwhile so that you feel that you're working on something and it's going to work out eventually is to keep connections so to, mm-hmm. as i was saying earlier get in touch with people speak to them keep connected with them and and uh, keep trying until you get there okay and when did you finally realize you wanted to work in in the areas of domestic violence when did when and how did that happen <laughs> so uh, we talked about this before and, yes. and how yes. i i am going through a phase where i'm struggling to find something <laughs> to that suits my interest but yes go on yeah yeah i'm smiling because uh, that is um, the second time in my actually many times in my life but second time in my life where in my li- in my career in sangat where i felt like i was actually pursuing um something that emerged from the ground and kind of helped me to make a change so i'm i'm smiling because it it's it's a um area that i really connect with deeply and the first time happened when i joined sangat and this whole idea of global mental health so um i entered the area of domestic violence sometime in 2016 2017 um when i had come back to india in early 2016 i started working with families affected by a relatives alcohol use and uh, that was a two year project uh, which was um, being run in goa and again it, the the in the, the goal of that project was to ensure that we understand what's the best way to help family members out now through that work we saw that there was a huge burden of domestic violence in spouses of men with drinking problems and um for me as a person and as a psychologist i felt extremely extremely upset that we could not do anything for these spouses who were um who were being beaten up who were being harassed who were being emotionally abused etc um and i, I think the the struggle back then was how do we best help them out in a way that is meaningful and relevant and important for them and um basically we do not have any evidence based models in india which would allow us to say i mean do that on the ground so um that initial um, discomfort that initial kind of moment of okay we are so helpless i do not know what to do with these women who are experiencing domestic violence um led to um a lot of things over the ne- over the next few years and um uh, we took it upon ourselves to um solve this problem of what is the best way in which we can intervene with survivors of domestic violence and of course the the angle the lens that we use is of uh, clinical research so in late 2017 we did a small study with uh, survivors of violence which went on for around 1 year where we try to understand what were the experiences of violence in these relationships and what were their support needs what are their desired support uh, needs what are their uh, what are places where they would like to go to for help in the future um and then that led to a lot more work uh, which is currently ongoing um in sangat where we're looking at interventions to now match what we learned from uh, that work over back then in 2017 2018 so um 
Yeah, yeah just to summarize, the interest came purely from what we saw on the ground. And uh, it was something that really affected us a lot. Uh, not only me, but a lot of my colleagues as well. And we really wanted to make a change in the way that uh, mental health care is conceptualized for domestic violence. And over the next few years, we then decided that we will do something about it. So I hope that in exactly five to six years time, I'm able to tell you that, okay, Arish, we have uh, solved one part of the problem. And this is what we are doing uh, on the ground to help survivors out. It's Good. a long fingers process, crossed. lengthy process. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed that we yeah. get there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so, so what's happening now, right now? What are the projects you're involved in at Sangat? Right. So, uh, I'll answer that question in two ways. So, in Sangat, okay. there are multiple opportunities to wear multiple hats. So, uh, mm-hmm. there are many projects that one can be involved in, and I find myself involved in many projects that I enjoy. I wear the hat of a psychologist, I wear the hat of a researcher, I wear the hat of a doctoral student, I wear the hat of a a supervisor, I wear the hat of a teacher. So there are many hats that I wear. But I'll I'll, I'll talk about the two major areas of interest and and, and, uh, two kind of major pieces of work that are keeping me uh, going every day now, especially during the pandemic and also uh, sometimes leading to uh, thoughts at night. Okay, fine. I mean, sometimes takes up my sleep as well in the night as to, okay, what are we doing about this? So uh, <laughs> one major area of work uh, which I'm involved in is uh, around um, the area of addictions. So as mm. I had said, when I had come back from London, my initial focus was on uh, families affected by addictions. So that is work that is going on. Um, especially through this domestic violence work that we're doing. So where we're trying to understand what are uh, the ways family members are affected by alcohol use in their partners and what what are the ways in which we can help them out. Um, I'm also involved in a lot of other work around addictions, um, conceptualizing models of care that can be delivered in the community for men with drinking problems. Um, And I'm involved in... um, understanding how do you help young people uh, reduce their substance use um, early on. And that's part of my PhD work that, I'm, that I have started off since last year. Um, and for that work, I'm looking at the potential of sports uh, mm. to achieve that outcome of reduction of substance use. And the second main um, area of work is uh, the domestic violence works. So conceptualizing models of care for domestic violence, intimate partner violence, Uh, dating violence, uh, prevention of uh, gender-based violence. These are the other areas in which um, the work is currently focused on. Yes, addictions and gender-based violence, the common theme across both, uh, many common themes, but one common theme across both is that we're trying to use um, rigorous methodology to understand the problem and to develop a a model, a care treatment package that we can then deliver to people who are affected by these problems. Well, well, you you said something interesting there, which I think is very relevant and needs to be highlighted. It's it's important that you understand the problem first before you go about solving it. Uh, Yes. Most of the stuff we we learn about in our curriculum, in our classroom, uh, stems from research conducted in the Western world, right? There's hardly any good quality research that's done in the Indian context. And you cannot simply import a solution that has worked in the West uh, into the Indian context without your understanding, because there are different facets that work on any problem here. So uh, that's that's something that needs to be highlighted. I think it's a very important facet of understanding the problem first. Absolutely, and in fact, we have a really good opportunity as students to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. I have nothing against doing a dissertation on music therapy at the master's level, but mm-hmm. my problem with with, with topics that sound fancy, which people, young people tend to do at, the, at their master's level, which is what we did as well back then, yeah, is that yeah. they tend to choose topics which sound very fancy and uh, are actually just, um, they don't add much to knowledge on the ground. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a wonderful opportunity to learn about your own culture, your own community, um, and to apply um, kind of basic scientific principles and methodologies to then understand that problem. Uh, so I think early on is when you can take the opportunity up to try research out in a, in a proper manner. 
um, yeah. and try to understand what affects people locally and and try to apply the yeah. your knowledge and and kind of develop questions which are relevant to local problems and then build mm. on that and work towards more of a global approach so mm. I, that, that's one thing that i again tell to younger people which is uh, <laughs> try to try to uh, choose something that keeps you going and that you're passionate about but is also relevant to the community where you work hmm. so so let's talk in terms of skills now so if you have someone who is graduating uh, from the third year the undergraduate course and you have someone who's graduating from the master's degree right what are some of the skill sets that you think are essential and that per- the, the, this person should walk out with from campus so at the the undergraduate course and at the master's course what are something you you would um want or expect by default in someone who has majored in psychology okay so the top 3 skills are skills that you don't learn in college for both undergraduate okay. courses as well as postgraduate so one is passion you really need to uh kind of pursue something and ensure that the principles that you follow in pursuing it are are from your heart and and now that you're extremely passionate about it so you need to be um, you don't need to necessarily know everything about a topic but at least your 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 knowledge and your practice should be informed by something that you really enjoy and uh, is that you're passionate about the second is flexibility again i don't think we learn this um, uh, at an un- undergraduate or postgraduate level it's just we, we grow up to learn that um, so we we need to be very flexible especially in our earlier days of of navigating our careers and being open to opportunities and being open to feedback being open to uh, ways of thinking that one may not have been exposed to previously so that flexible mindset is is what mm. we require and third i think especially for psychology students is empathy um we need to be empathetic individuals and empathy does not only come into play in clinical practice it comes into play everywhere um if you have these characteristics then i'm sure you'll go a long way in your career mm. now uh, when it comes to skills which you can really learn from your undergraduate degree and postgraduate degree i think um at an undergraduate level you should be able to um understand the basic concepts of psychology after completing a uh, third year so understand uh, what is psychology and and what are the various um, areas within it and at least get a better grasp of one of the areas within all of uh, the areas that you may have been exposed to uh, in your undergraduate studies and um i think the second skill set is um your communication and writing skills um so i yeah. i would expect that an undergraduate student should have that so that they're able to then succeed in um in their careers and as well as education which which happens further okay. uh from a postgraduate student um are you asking me from the perspective of a student who wants to enter research or just generally uh, someone who completes their masters generally not just for research but we, you can of course elaborate on that aspect as well right so then um, i would think that two major skills uh, three major and actually two because i don't think we really focus on clinical practice in our uh, masters level courses mm. so i don't think that people will be fully equipped with clinical skills after their masters and then that's a wrong expectation to have so one important thing is critical thinking so um to be able to um look at um developments in the area to able to be able to criticize and critique them to be able to review them to be able to reflect on them um and then to apply that uh, to real world problems is something that i would expect from a masters level student in a more kind of uh, clear fashion mm-hmm. and the second thing that one would expect from a masters level student is uh if not um advanced level but some familiarity with uh, research methodology which i think mm-hmm. is relevant um for a lot of work that people tend to pursue after their masters as well um i don't think that masters in clinical and counseling psychology courses um in india allow you to gain sufficient clinical skills so that you're able to practice so i i won't make that assumption that or even imply yeah. that you need to have a good skill set to practice in the field of clinical or counseling psychology mm, no you you tend to learn it on the job once you 
uh, walk out of the campus and then maybe if you're interning somewhere or your your uh, you know your first job you you get the chance to watch someone in action i think that's where you learn clinical and counseling skills more than the in the classroom absolutely absolutely yeah. yes you, you uh, i'm glad you mentioned critical thinking because uh, that's something that i tried to i try to focus on in in my classrooms and i struggle with Mm-hmm. uh getting students to to uh parse and uh, discuss maybe a piece of text or maybe a case and to frame their own opinions and and judgments on it and it's something i struggle with because a lot of students uh it, it isn't easy to to learn critical thinking it, it, it happens over a period of time and a lot of students who come into the undergraduate course really have a tough time doing it uh they do clear the course by the way but but uh, i i think uh, a lot more needs to be done on that front where they walk out with that sort of a because if you have that if you have critical thinking then you can apply it to anything else that comes your way and absolutely absolutely it, and i think a lot of the responsibility is also on academic environments right if the school mm. the college environment needs to promote critical thinking so i'm sure mm. the reason why you're find one of the reasons why you must be finding it difficult is because earlier on they may not have been exposed to that kind of an yeah. environment and now they have yeah. suddenly been expected to do that so again yeah. we need to be slow we need to ensure that we're still encouraging that and then working at the pace at which um, the class works at but ensuring that we still have that goal of uh, them gaining those skills in the long term yeah yeah that actually if i could reflect on something which i think is particularly relevant for um, okay. someone who might be uh, considering a degree outside of india mm. um when i had one of the thoughts that i had before i was going on for my second masters in global mental health was i knew the kind of teaching that i had been exposed to earlier and the kind of learning outcomes that are emphasized on in the indian learning system and i was a bit concerned will i really survive in um, that system or not because that really mm. the, the main premise of that of 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 the main focus of the learning outcomes there is critical thinking and being able to apply that and that was one mm. concept that came up in my mind because i was wondering that okay all my life i've been exposed to study in a particular way and then at the end of the year you then answer exams and you you, you do your best at that and then move on to the next year Mm-hmm. and uh, i think i surprised myself and I, when i when i was there although i was concerned in a few months i i i did feel better because um critical thinking and the application of that as well is not something that you expect to do at the end of the year it's something mm-hmm. that they start from day one so most of the lectures that we had were uh, centered around discussions and not around uh, kind of teaching which is only from the tutor to the student so mm-hmm. um, that's another thing i think people should keep in mind that perhaps if you d- did not have the opportunities earlier you still can have the opportunity to do to learn that and if you're not going to be pursuing formal education in the future there are a zillion courses that you can do online which will allow you to develop mm-hmm. these skills mm-hmm. and zillion people that you can meet as well who can help you develop those skills um, and mentor you and and things like that. So I think that's a very important trait to have and that uh, people can get exposed to it and should uh, yeah should try as much as possible to get it, to get exposed to it. Hmm okay. Um and and uh, hang on I I forgot what I want to ask you now. Well I've forgotten. No I There was something I wanted to ask you that I forgot about it. <laughs> or right, okay uh so uh, how's uh, how's the research field uh, or rather i don't know i mean i don't know how to frame this question but how has the pandemic affected the way you conduct research right now how is it affecting uh, the work that you do the pandemic has basically done two things one is that uh, it has stalled all our active on the ground work the field work where we're engaging with participants and community stakeholders to conduct the research across these different areas including addictions and violence and uh, the second way in which it has affected our work is uh, actually positively where we are looking at uh, using tools to collect uh, 
the data that we want to collect from uh, our communities. So we're looking at online methods to collect data. So for example, through the use of online discussions, uh, interviews that can be done through Skype, surveys that can be done online. So it has pushed us to um, become more comfortable with that and, and yeah. kind of learn and uh, quickly work on that. Which, which reminds me that uh, your survey on COVID-19, that I answered that, so it, mm. was, it was good. But how did that come about? What was the thought process behind it? Sure. So uh, the intent uh, of that survey is to map the psychological as well as social impacts of the pandemic on people's lives. And mm. what we're trying to do is um, not only collect uh, cross-sectional data, so not only collect data at one single time point, but to follow up people over time and seeing how the pandemic leads to longer term outcomes. Uh, what, what are the longer term outcomes of the pandemic, both in terms of psychological mm. and social outcomes? So um, it's an online survey. It's the first time that we're trying out something like that. Um, it was a completely um, a rich learning experience for us because it was the first time learning how to do that and implement that over a very short period of time. Mm. And uh, we're trying to recruit uh, around 2,000 to 2,500 participants from all over India to be able to understand this with the intention that we produce findings which are then relevant to policymakers, academic groups, and even the lay public in trying mm. to understand what helps people um, when they are in situations like these. Mm. Yeah, uh, Abhijit had put up a tweet saying that uh, you all had got 400 uh, yes. responses within 24 hours. I was very happy about that. Absolutely, absolutely. So we had been very closely monitoring um, after we released the survey just to see yeah. what was the kind of response. And uh, we were so overwhelmed by the fact that there were 400 responses in a matter of 36 hours. Uh, we have many challenges going ahead. So, of course, we can celebrate that moment and we are going to celebrate when we reach 1000 as well. But we need to ensure that we get um, continued engagement over time and that people are interested in this work and find that relevant as well. And that's going to be our main focus in the future. All right. Great. Yes. And thanks for okay. filling it out, Arish. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. I mean, I, I want to be uh, have the experience of being part of a study as well, because I think that's also important. So yeah. that's why I went for it. I hope some of my students have. So for those who are watching, if you haven't, you, please you, do, please, please do. do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you should answer this survey. Okay, um, I think I have exhausted Thanks, my question because now. I was going to end with that, and I don't need to uh, then end with that. But just to encourage <laughs> everyone, please do look yeah, up the survey, yeah. um, and then uh, please fill it out if you're above the age of eighteen. Yes, thank you, Rita. I, ho I hope we can connect more often and talk about uh, uh, what has been going on at Sangat uh, since. Since then, right? So thanks for joining in today. Arish, I absolutely yeah. enjoyed. As I was saying, I enjoy talking to you, and I and I hope this was uh, relevant to the students who go on to hear this later on. Um, if I can be of any help to any of your students, I'm very very happy for them to connect uh, with me through you. Um, and I think the reason why I'm offering that was because I was also a student once, not too long back. And I had a lot of barriers that I faced uh, in navigating these career choices until I landed up with a job which became my calling for the rest of my life. And also within that, of course, there are challenges that you face. But um, mm. if I can put that to use for anybody who's, uh, who needs help, who needs support, who needs advice, I'm completely happy to do that. Um, and I'm happy for anyone to connect with me. I wish them the very best with their pursuit of psychology and, and I hope that they go on to do whatever they enjoy doing in the future. Thank you, Rita. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. And I hope some of them come forward and, and bug me to talk to you about <laughs> uh, what they want to. Right? Yeah. Thank you then. Okay. Thanks, Arish. <laughs>